Alrighty, blessings to you. Thank you everybody for joining to Choose Life Church online uh, live streaming. This is a great time for us to join together as we are going to be celebrating Christ. And today as we gather together, I understand that actually we continue to go through this time of is isolation as we're spending this time at home. You know, we have this order as stay home, stay healthy. But this is what we know, that God is not limited. God is not limited by the quarantine. God is not limited by the virus. God is not limited geographically or historically. He is all over the places. And this is why when we come to him right now, this is the great opportunity for every single one of us to be able to turn our hearts to Jesus. Turn our hearts to Jesus. And I understand that sometimes we think about God as the one who should bless us all and always give. But we know this. Sometimes he allows certain times, devastating times, to go, to come into our lives. And then as Job once said, that actually God gave and he can take away as well. You know, he gives and takes away. And this is the promise for us. As we come to him, that we can always, always be open for him so that he would fill us up. We're not going to be just coming to God when everything clicks. No, we'll come to Him regardless of the circumstances because God loves us regardless of the circumstances. Let me pray and with that we will start. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now and we ask you so that you would bless every single one of us right now who is present in this building and make this live stream okay, happen and everybody who is joining us right now online. We ask you so that you would give us this chance of opening our hearts to you and to celebrate you, to worship you, our Father. We come to you and we're grateful for everything you're going to be doing today. It is in your name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. And we encourage every one of you to start singing with us. Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful. Where streams of abundance flow, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun shining down on me when the world all as it should be blessed be your name blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering when there is pain in the offering blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out, turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your 
Great opportunity for us to join together and to celebrate Christ together as we sing. Yes, celebrate. And you know, this is a great time for every single one of us as we come to Him. You know, and by the way, thank you for joining to this a live stream of Choose Life Church. And we ask you to participate together. And so many things uh, you can do to participate today. First of all, you can sing with us, right? This is a great time of singing together. At the same time, if you have something that needs a prayer, or encouragement or if there is any way we can assist you through in, with anything you're going through in life please let us know you have a live message function that you can type there or you can send us a private message and we would love to pray for you we would love to connect with you too remember God gives us a chance to do life together we are not alone I love this analogy the church is the family that we can belong each other we can belong to God's family and it was all possible because of God's love all possible because of God's love well right now we're gonna sing a song that would probably uh, give us a chance to do a little bit of bouncing around and here's the thing if you want to you can stand up before your computer you don't have to you know if you want to you can clap you can participate in clapping right now so let's practice this all right so that's gonna be the thing that you can join in right now as well we're going to be singing this song that will say the words like this. I will sing forever of your love come down. With my hands to heaven, shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love come down. Okay? Let's try to, see it. Let's try to sing it together if we can. Okay? And... I will sing forever of your love come down with my hands to heaven shout your praises loud I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out I will sing forever of your love come one two three Once was blind, I could not see Chains of sin had shackled me But God in heaven heard my plea Jesus, Jesus rescued me Jesus, Jesus rescued me I will sing forever of your love come down With my hands to heaven, talk your praises loud I was lost I will sing forever of your love down Now grace so sweet 
It floods my soul And hope eternal Won't let go My debt erased At Calvary Jesus, Jesus Rescued me Jesus, Jesus Rescued me I will sing forever Of your love Come down With my hands to him Shout my praises loud I was lost And he pulled me out I will sing Beyond the sky, a song will sing for all of time. The grave is empty, I am free. Jesus, Jesus, rescued me. Jesus, Jesus, rescued me. I will sing forever of your love. Come down with my hands to heaven. Shout your praises now. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love come down. I will sing forever of your love come down. Put my hands to heaven, shout your praises now. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love come down. I will sing forever of your love. just a great thing for us that we can come to him at absolutely any time I love the fact that we can open our hearts to him and he is the one who would come into our life I remember the story of Daniel when three of his friends were confronted like by the false accusation they were confronted because of their belief in God and as they did not bow their knees before the king Nebuchadnezzar. What happened that actually they were thrown into the fiery furnace. And the king was amazed because even though there were three friends of Daniel in there, but he saw that there was somebody, the fourth one, looking like the son of man, standing between them. Standing among them. In this fiery situation of life, Jesus is among them. Jesus is among us today and this is the thing as we're going to sing right now this song it's going to be a prayer and a and proclamation of there is some somebody in this fire with us as we go through all of the situation of life difficult ones uplifting ones anything as we go through this crisis right now as we go through this coronavirus situation we know that God is with us There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be in this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the waters Holding back the seas And should I ever need reminding Of how I've been set free There's a cross that bears the burden Where another died for me There is another in the fire Should I fall in the space between what remains of me in the 
this reckoning Either way I won't be to the things I'm And should I ever need reminding What power set me free There is a clay that holds no body And all the power lives in me There is another in the fire There is another in the fire Cause I know that nothing that is standing between us today thank you for loving us unconditionally and so beautifully and so devotedly you have made a covenant with us you did not make a partnership or an agreement you make a covenant with us that you will love us no matter what and you will be present with us and so now as we go through this difficult situation we know that you are standing with us there's another in the fire when we're sick and afflicted. There's another in the fire when we are going through some difficult relationship. There is another in the fire when somebody is losing their life right now. There's another in the fire when we're looking up to you and we're asking so that you would bless us and provide. There is another in the fire amidst all of the situation and all of the global chaos that is happening right now. God, 
you are present here this is so beautiful and we ask you so that you would touch our hearts you would heal us you would bring us to yourself and help us to remember that we're never never alone there is another in the fire There's another in the fire. Let's pray. There is another in the fire. There's Jesus in this fire. And he's standing with us because he is the one in this fire with us. that nothing is between us right now you are such an amazing God that you're so close to us offering your love and forgiveness to every single one of us and I pray for everybody who's watching this live stream right now or watch this later would you please bestow your grace send your grace and healing and restoration and power and a breakthrough in their lives so we thank you for your presence and for being with us in this place wherever we are because you are not limited you are not limited jesus you are not limited and you are not on quarantine right now you are working as your father is working and as the holy spirit is working right now so we thank you we thank you jesus we thank you it is in your name we pray amen Amen. Welcome to church. Welcome to the undying body of the ever-living Son, where God's promises and God's people are radically made one. Welcome to the romance of the world, the marriage ceremony of Christ, where God is betrothed to man by proposing with his life. Welcome the only place where the unholy can meet holiness and yet holy still survives. Welcome to the only place that you can walk in dead and yet come out alive. Welcome to this place, this place, whether on pews or chairs, in walls or air, under steeples or stairs, by thousands or in pairs, this place, this place is legendary, holy, ancient, modern, famous, hated, living, vibrant, ageless, not because of a location. Not because there are cars parked on the pavement. Not because you made a sign and named it. This place is an amazement because of the one who creates it. Welcome 
to the place where individuals are shaped into a larger whole, where bread and wine feed our hearts and intoxicate our souls, where race, money, and power no longer have a role, where the outcast, impoverished, and broken come to be consoled. Welcome to our home, the bride of Christ on a reckless search. Welcome to life. Welcome to church. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome to church. Again, this is a very unusual way for us to do that, but we're grateful to live in the 21st century that we can use the technology to still be connected with you. Before we're going to head out, let me say that, that we love you so much. Thank you for joining. So, so that you would know that we love you in a very tangible way. If you would provide some comments or if you would provide some prayer requests or praises, if you can do it down below in the comment section, we would love, love, love so much to stay connected with you. So please feel free to leave a comment, to share a thought, to share an encouragement. And also, if there is any way that we can pray for you or help you in a tangible and physical way, please let us know in a direct message or in the comments below. So we thank you for that. Well, this is an opportunity for us to continue to be the church. So the church is outside of this building. The church is wherever you are either present here or wherever you are watching this like in a live cast right now and so this is the thing we love to stay connected there is there will be a lot of information on our face uh, Facebook page about the upcoming connection groups that we do through Zoom. So we do want to get plugged in in the middle of the week so that we can share this life together, study the Bible together, praying for one another. So if you would love to be included in our uh, Facebook messenger group please let us know and we will let you know when the uh, closest groups and will be coming up. Also uh, the last but not least as of right now we are not certain as far as what way will Easter be if we're going to be doing Easter this way or we can gather together in a limited amount of numbers we do not know that we will give you the further announcements but th at the same time we can still talk about resurrected Jesus among our friends and family and co-workers we can use social media we can call each other we can share this link to this live cast with your friends and family and you can do it not just for easter but you can do it any given time this is a great time and opportunity for us to be able to share the news of resurrected jesus with people around us so please share this podcast share this live stream this video that you are watching right now as a matter of fact you can even do it now you can start a watch party right now on Facebook and invite your friends to listen to the message that we are about to hear and I believe that um, throughout this time it will be very very important to hear what brother Nate uh, will be sharing with us today because he will be talking about nothing else but love what is love and love is very critical and important right now I'm not going to be stealing away from him sir his sermon but I do want to say one thing one statistics it said actually with the fact that people are spending more time at home the domestic violence tripled in different places so the love isn't shown everywhere, okay, everywhere by everyone this is why love is so important right now and very needed at this moment so that we would cling to the source of this love. Alrighty guys, with this being said, thank you for joining. We're going to continue on with the message of today and let me pray for Nate as he comes to the front. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us an opportunity to join in together with you that we can hear your word and be touched by that. We're thankful and excited for everything you're going to be doing today. Please speak to us so that our hearts would open to your love. We pray, uh, we pray to you in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Blessings to you. All right. So this will be effort number two. Uh, back in December, I uh, gave my first sermon ever. And uh, I didn't do so poorly that I was told never to do it again. So uh, hopefully this time will go as smooth. Uh, today what we're going to talk about is what is love? Uh, love is a term that gets thrown around a lot uh, in the same way that the secular world likes to blaspheme the name of God. Even within the church, we see the word love used over and over and over again. If you ask five or six different people what the definition of love is, you'll probably get 10 or 15 different answers. Uh, love seems to be this 
panacea, this apply it to everything sort of a term where nobody has a problem with love until you try and figure out what love is. And that's something that's really important for us as Christians because with what the scripture tells us, we're the only ones that have it. And I don't mean we, I mean we as in God is the one that has it and we gain access to it through our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're gonna be unfolding today. We're gonna be looking at what is love and, and why does that matter? Because in this time, people are gonna be looking for something different. People are gonna be looking for something that's distinctive, something that stands out. When some people are scared to death of what's going to happen, what's coming, the changes in the political scene, the changes in the social scene, when we have love, those things don't have to dominate our life. Those things don't have to dictate how we behave, how we interact with other people. And so when we genuinely demonstrate that love, we have a witness without even having said anything yet. So let's try and dig into this. First off, we need to know what love is. If we don't know what love is, and it's just a buzzword, if it's just something that we use to make people feel better, then it loses its significance. And that's really bad for us as Christians because love is extremely important to everything that we do. We'll start with our first verse in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So love is very important to what we are doing. It's not about knowledge, it's not about understanding, it's not about even having all the faith that you possibly could, but it's about love. And we see this highlighted again later on, in a, or I should say earlier really, in a John 13, 35, where he said, Jesus said, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, there are certain topics within the church, doctrines and theology and all that kind of stuff, which is really hard for those who are outside the church to understand. But love isn't one of those. Love is one of those things that we are recognized for regardless of the shape of our church, the, the nature of our prayers, or the nature of our service. Love is something that is universal in that sense where Christians are known for their love. So if we don't know what love is, if we don't know how to live it out, then we're gonna be having a very difficult time trying to stand out from all the gurus and all the experts in the world that say, well, this is the path you need to follow. This is why you need to do this. This would be a good thing to do. And so what we need to do is really understand what love is. Now, it's not an accident that love has so many meanings. So why does it have so many meanings? This comes down to worldview, and this is gonna be the kind of boring scholarly portion of the, uh, the presentation, but the worldview is basically, it's how you look at the world. It's one of those words that's kind of more obvious in its definition than it might seem. So how you look at the world is gonna change how you interpret the information that's coming in and how you behave on that and all that kind of stuff. Christianity has a worldview where we say that God is the source of all truth. And while there's certainly more to it, truth is going to become really important as we continue on. So with Christianity, God is the source of truth. You know, God is the one that created everything, so if everything came from that one source, then, then that's going to be where we look to to figure out how things are supposed to be. But a few hundred years ago, Western, Western civilization saw the fruits of what God could provide and said, well, we can do better. We can produce those same fruits, but without God. And that gave us the modern, secular worldview, where we don't need God to find truth. We can rely on science, we can rely on psychology, we can figure it out on our own, and we don't need God anymore. Now this is a pretty rad radical change, because now instead of looking outside, we're looking around to our, each other. We're looking and say, hey look, what have you found? What is the test that you've got? What is the experiment that you're running? You know, what did you get as a result when you tried this, that, and the other? And so it shifted the focus from God to us. And then 100 years ago or so, we saw another shift where even the truth that we tried to find between us wasn't good enough. It didn't get us what we wanted to. Because this whole movement away from God wasn't about truth. It wasn't really about finding truth. It was about replacing God. And so the next step was, well, Truth isn't even outside of me anymore, it's gonna be inside of me. 
And that's where we get the postmodern secular worldview, which is what we've been dancing with now and what we see demonstrated on a daily basis. The postmodern worldview says that we are gods that define our own truth. So it's not a blue sky, it's a green sky because I think so. I have a particular gender because I say so. I love a particular kind of person. I love a particular person because I say so. This is my truth and you can't take it from me. And so what we see is we shifted from looking at God for truth to each other for truth to ourselves. And it's an inherently selfish mindset. And it's one that doesn't work. It doesn't last. It doesn't build anything that's stable because we're all different. The things that we like are different. The things that we find important in life are different. And the goals that we have are different. Our life is different. We have different beliefs on how we're supposed to behave because of the things that we've experienced. So even in all these efforts, we were just moving from a system of stability and order towards disorder. We moved from being able to have homes where you don't have to lock the door because you can trust your neighbors to transvestites and transsexuals reading children books about Satan worship. And I wish that was an exaggeration, but the, the way that the world is going now, it is not just ambivalent about God, it's an active hatred. And so love is important in how we respond to that hatred of God that is coming to the surface that is ever more clear than it has been before. So the truth about love matters. What love really is, is important. And what makes this simple is that there are two categories of truth. There is objective truth, which is outside of us, and then there is the subjective truth, which is inside of us. And what we saw through these different worldviews is that we shifted from trying to find out and share objective truth to subjective truth. It's now about what I believe to be true. You know, objective truth is like two plus two equals four. There's not a lot of argument that can be made about that. It's not five, it's not five million. You know, there are a lot of wrong answers to two plus two, but there's one right answer, and it's something that we can validate pretty easily. We said, you know, you got two and two, okay, we got four. So we said, okay, well, because we can figure that kind of stuff out, we can replace objective truth with subjective truth, and it'll be good enough for us. But that doesn't help us to have any sort of unity. So subjective truth, it's like your favorite food. You know, I like a particular kind of food. Uh, Dave here likes a different kind of food. Yuri over there likes a different kind of food. And so what ends up happening is that while objective truth can unify us, we can all agree that 2 plus 2 equals 4, subjective truth separates us. It creates distinctions. It creates circumstances where we're not going to get what we like. And when the entirety of civilization, when all of our relationships are based on us getting what we like, it's not going to work. It's not going to last. There's not going to be stability in there. So what we want to do is we really want to understand what love is. And since most of the definitions that you're going to hear are about actions, we want to look at what love does according to the Bible. So here we're going to hit... 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 10. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. And where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. So love is going to be what lasts. Love is going to be what persists when everything around us is falling apart. And that's why understanding what love is is so important as Christians to understand how we're supposed to behave. Because what you'll notice about all these descriptions, you know, again, it's, it's not just action. Love is an addendum to that action. And so one of the things that we can say about love then is that love is not passive. So love does not just sort of exist. It's not something that you feel and then that's kind of it. It's not like you just sort of have this moment of experience and then it moves on. What we see is time and again that love prompts action. That love motivates us to do something specific. That love is not just there but it creates an overflow in our hearts and it drives us to making a choice, to, to doing something. And we see that in scripture as well where 
Love is not just described as a passing experience or a feeling, but is, is a way to live. So in 1 Corinthians 16, 14, it says, let all that you do be done with love. In John 15, 13, it says, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. In John 3, 16, which a lot of people are gonna know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so what we see is that love is driving action. It's not just passive. It's not just sitting in the sidelines. That it's, it's promoting movement. But what ended up happening, if we remember, the worldview shift, it occurred because people saw the fruits of love. They saw the fruits of truth, and they wanted to replace it. And so what ended up happening is they started with actions. Well, if we can perform the actions that came from love, then we'll be good. Then we'll have replaced God. We will have no need for him, we'll have our own truth, and things will be better. But the problem is, is that those actions are essentially the byproduct of love. And so without the prerequisite for those actions, you're not gonna be able to sustain that. You're not gonna be able to keep it up. You're not gonna know when to apply it or when to act because you don't have the love that's supposed to drive the action. You're just trying to parrot a line or mimic an action to be a puppet almost for something. And instead of it being love, it's anything else. So what we see is actions alone are not loving. And if we go back to our first verse, you know, though I sp- in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I become sounding brass or clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So what we're seeing is that even within our passage so far, it's not the actions that are what's significant, necessarily. Because if we're taking those actions, but we don't have love, then it doesn't matter. It's not profitable to us. It doesn't mean anything. So even if you know all the doctrines, if you know all the scientific facts, if you know all this stuff and you understand it and you can explain it, even if you're sacrificing your life to serve other people, if you're giving through charity, but you don't have love, then it doesn't matter. And that's pretty radical. But we know this because God doesn't just judge our actions. Our actions are not what we are judged on alone. It's the heart of the matter. God does not judge our actions alone. In Matthew 7, 22 through 23, it says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So note they did it in Jesus' name, but they didn't do it out of love. They saw what Jesus was doing, and they wanted to duplicate it. They wanted everything that came from it, They didn't understand why he did it. They didn't understand the love that motivated his actions. Further, we see in 1 Samuel 16, 7, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at the appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him for the Lord does not see as a man sees for a man looks at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart. So our actions alone can't be loving. Love has to come before those actions and it has to guide us and it has to motivate us. And so the best place to start then to figure out how this works is to, well, let's look at how God acted with love. So in John 15, 9 through 10, Jesus says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So what we see here is that Love is not, again, it's not passive. It's not something you just experience once. It's something that's going to be continuous. It's like a process. It's something that is alive. It's active. And when we don't appreciate that, when we just think of it as a a passing phrase, oh, I love you, it dismisses the significance of that mean, the word, the meaning of it, the importance of it. And we don't want to lose that. If we dilute love, what do we have to offer? If love is what lasts and everything else is going to fall away and we lose love because we don't understand it, it's not going to be a good scenario. Further, in Hebrews 12, 4 through 7, I'm going to have to refer to my Bible here because I got the text off the page on mine. It's probably a little small up there. 
So Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, 4 through 7. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son who he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? So contrary to the way that the world tries to treat love, where it's this positive thing, it's something everybody wants. In fact, we find that love, the real love, is something that the world does not like at all. Something that the world has cast as evil. But we'll get to that a little bit more. We still have more demonstrations of how God acts with love. Because it's not just about one time, it's a process. In Romans 5, 8 through 10, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Saved from what? Saved from what? And this goes back to why love is an important concept in the first place, because if we were perfect, then there would be no opportunity for change. Perfection doesn't have any movement one way or the other. But if we are imperfect, and we have things that we can change, if we have things we have to learn, and especially if you've got children, you'll know that your children do not, they're not born with an understanding of anything. You have to teach them everything from don't touch the hot thing to don't talk to this stranger. So love is involving yourself in that process. It's not just about doing what people want. It's about doing what people need. People didn't want to be saved from sin even back then. Even before we didn't see the fruits or we saw the fruits of what God had, People were still thinking, I can still save myself. I can still do it on my own. I want God to try a way for me to be glorified, not, not for me to have to trust in somebody else. How, how is that love? But the reality is that what the world thinks of as love isn't so at all. And we see that further in uh, our next verse in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. The dynamic between husband and wife is one that is very contentious these days. And the Bible does provide for us a framework, and sometimes people will read portions of this, but they won't necessarily understand where love comes into play. So it says, uh, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle in any, or any such thing, that she should be holy and without blemish. So love is not just doing what people like, but it's doing what people need. And so what we would see then is that if love is about involving in a process, if it's about doing what people need and not what people want, then the reality is love is not universal. Love is not something that is all around us. Something that we all have easy access to because by our own nature, we don't want to look to somebody else's process. We don't want somebody else to invest in our lives. We want to be able to do it all ourselves. You know, we saw earlier, you know, love is not self-seeking, but we are not naturally self, others seeking, excuse me. Naturally, we do want to seek ourselves. Naturally, we do not understand love. And we see this affirmed in scripture, 1 John 4, 7 through 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love God, oh, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is love. So God is, it's a very really common phrase you hear, and, you know, people talk about that, you know, oh, God is love, and, you know, so everybody's going to be this, that, and the other. And it's like, well, God is love, like we said, that love is not just a, a passive thing that exists, and it's involved in a process. And so the world that hates God could not have love because the world is not born of God. We see this further. 1 John 4, 16. 
and we've known and believed that love that God has for us, God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. We know the world doesn't do that. The world seeks itself. The world is not loving. It can't both love and yet reject God at the same time if God is love. Finally, in John 14, 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be beloved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. There are many gurus throughout history that have said, well, I like the teachings of Christianity, and maybe I even like Jesus, but I don't like all the people that are involved. I don't really want to have you know, all that. Again, it's, I like the byproducts. I like the fruit, but I don't want to water the tree. I don't want to be invested. I don't want to be grafted in. And it doesn't work that way. The world does not love God. The world hates God. So it's not even just a passing ambivalence. Again, it's, it's an active hatred of God. In John 7, 7, we see, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify of it that its works are evil. So the actions that the world would try and take to replicate love, they're evil. It's not based out of truth. It's not based out of God. It's based out of what the world wants and what the world sees. And so when you have that kind of a condemnation, it's going to provoke a response. It's going to provoke anger. Or perhaps it might condemn, it might convict, and some people might respond to that. But it's not something that's natural for us to respond to. This is Jesus Christ having to come into the picture to try and complete it, because we can't do it on our own. Further, John 15, 18 through 23. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. Oh, lost my spot. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep your also, yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they not, do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. So what we see here is that the world does have a kind of love, but it's not from God. And so that's where we get into our, our big question today. What is love? And what's fun about that is that this, the definition is actually pretty simple. Love is the desire to have intimate relationship. To be with somebody. That's it. Like it's not all of these, it's the desire to have intimate relationship. And if you swap in that definition with the word love, you'll see where it makes sense. You know, for God so desired to have relationship with us that he sent his only son. You know, if we want relationship, we are going to have to have love. And it's an amusing time that we're in. It's a troubling time because we see in many of the prophecies about the end of times, uh, one of the things that's included is that you know, men will stop loving one another. And it's not about service, it's not about care, it's not about lack of knowledge, it's when people are no longer pursuing relationships, when people are no longer trying to have a connection with other people, when people are no longer trying to bridge that gap. Because God is beyond us. God is perfect, and we are not. And so there's a process that occurs through love to try and rebuild that relationship. The world distracts from this simple truth and the consequences which would come from the rejection of a perfect love. So if God has done this for us, if God has acted in love, we are then holding the ball and have to make a choice. We have to do something with that. And if we accept it, then we have one path to follow. If we reject it, we have another. But we are given that option. John 3.17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him, or that the world through him might be saved. It wasn't about just explaining to us that we don't get love. It was about restoring the relationship that had been broken since Genesis. In 2 Peter 3.9, we see, Oh, I 
go down the wrong spot. Is it up there? Yeah, there we go. I'll try not to have you look at the back of my head for very long. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's the process. We aren't repentant now, but we might be in the future. And God is patient, and through love is making choices to act in our lives to try and bring about that repentance. God is investing in us for a potential future to have relationship again. It's not just about us feeling good about ourselves or good about God or being able to say the right lines, but about the relationship. Because that's what we were created for. We were created for relationship. We were not created for isolation. That's part of why this time of isolation due to the virus has been so disturbing for so many people because we weren't created for that. We weren't created to be shoved off in little holes. We were created to be among each other. We were created to be among God. And we don't have that right now. But we have hope because through love, we can have it again one day. So then that causes a question, at least in my mind it did, and so we're going to go that way. Where does our love come from then? If God is the source of love, and God has been acting in love, and the world has a kind of love, where, where is it coming from? Is it really from inside of me, or, or do I have to go to God for it? And the truth is, again, pretty simple. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In Galatians 5, 22 through 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Right there, first one. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Own goodness in there, too. Against such there is no law. So we're told love isn't going to be of us. It's not of the flesh. That we do need to go to God in order to get it. We see that further in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So it's not even our love that we're trying to share. Because the reality is our love and the world's love is a lot like our righteousness. It's not ours. In Isaiah 64, 6, it says... We were all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. When we just try and go through the motions, it doesn't mean anything. The best that we could be is still not enough. We still have to go to God in order to love, because God has already demonstrated what love looks like. He's given us an objective definition that we can all look to and say, this is love. How do I act like that? In Romans 4, 20 through 25, we see this again, this dynamic where what we have is not of us, but it is given to us by God. He, referring to Abraham, did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully convinced that what he, God, had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our, defense, our offenses and was raised because of our justification. So that's why Jesus' love is so perfect, why it is extolled. Because what he did gave us an opportunity to be reconciled with God, to have that relationship again, to not just be isolated and on our own and scared and cold and without hope, but that we could be reconnected with God who loves us, who has been sacrificing, who has been taking action since the dawn of time in order to take care of us, in order to look after us, in order to provide what we need, not necessarily what we want. 
And so we see this reflected in how we are told to love. We see this reflected in what we then do once we have accepted that gift, once that relationship has been reconciled. We see where our priorities are placed, and that tells us a bit about that process of love. In Matthew 22, 36 through 39, Jesus said to him, with respect to the greatest commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So what we see right off the bat is that our greatest command is to love, is to be like God. So obviously that's going to be something we're not going to be able to do on our own. So again, we need God in order to be able to accomplish this. We need something beyond ourselves, something that is objective, something we can all agree on, something we can all look at and see and know. It's not in us. Mark 8.35 says, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. When we act in love, it's sacrificial in the sense that, again, we're not doing what people want. If it was about just doing what people wanted, then it would be about what their desires are, about satisfying what people think that they want. But again, as with children, we see oftentimes what children want isn't what's good for them. And it's not an accident that God describes believers as his children because maturity-wise, we rarely ever get to the point where we're beyond childish in the way that we try and interact with the world. It is so difficult to get out of our own way to let God live through us that we don't have another example except for Jesus Christ of what that really looks like. We don't have another example And so what we do then is we don't try to replicate it ourselves. We don't try and carbon copy it. We ask God for it. We say, God, work on me. We put God in control of the choices that we make. We put God in control of the path that we want to walk because we know that God has already done everything he could just to have that relationship with us again. Why would we now lose trust that he's not going to take care of us? that he's not going to understand what it is we really need or what others really need. And we see that in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. I think I have a typo saying 16. This is talking about the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So not only do we have a promise from Christ that he's going to be with us, again, affirming that we are not alone even in this time of physical isolation enforced by the circumstances, but we're not achieving any of this stuff by ourselves. It's not us, it's not our strength. We have to tap into what Jesus Christ has already done to let him live through us. Uh, Think of it like filling up a car with gas. If you go to this gas station, you you fill it up, and then you can go a pretty long distance. Now, when the needle goes to E, it's empty, but you got fumes. You may be able to go for a while, but you may not know how long. And in many ways, that's how this great commission works with us. When we just go out and do works on our own, we're running on fumes. We're not going back to God. We're not emphasizing the truth that is love. We're saying to people, hey, look, you can do it if you just do these things. These are the things that you should care about. But in reality, it's like what we should be doing is telling everybody, hey, there's a gas station you can go fill up. Hey, there's a Costco that's got toilet paper. Hey, there's a solution that I have found outside of myself that has brought me not only temporary peace, but in this case, because it's salvation, because it's such a big thing, this is eternal peace. It's totally different. This is eternal toilet paper. It never runs out. You know, that's how much God loves us, is to say, hey, look, I'm doing all the heavy lifting. I just need you to come along with. I need you to be my preachers, my teachers, to teach people not about go and do a bunch of stuff, but that Jesus Christ died for us, that Jesus Christ died so that we could be restored in relationship with God, and then not only could we be restored, but then we can be messengers of that love to the rest of the world. 
And that message is going to be unique. It's going to be distinctive. The world doesn't have that. And so in this time of confusion, of concern about what's going on, that is distinct. That is special. That is something that you can give to people that will never run out. That is something that will follow them on into eternity. So we need to focus on love. And so how can we tell in the day-to-day? You know, these, these big concepts are great, I get that, but how do we tell in the day-to-day if we are truly being loving to other people? Well, it starts when we genuinely demonstrate God's love by having a genuine care for somebody else that prompts us to take action on their behalf to enable and enrich their relationship with God. So now that's a very high-level definition, but it's about adjusting what we do based on who we're interacting with. So for those who are already in the faith, what we do to enrich that relationship is going to be different than those who are still lost. And so what we want to do is know that for those who are lost, for those who do not yet have that repentance, we need to be preaching the truth, the truth of God's love, the faith in Jesus Christ. That's our most important thing that we can give anybody in this world, is that understanding, that truth, that knowledge. It's not just anything, it's that God has already set up for us a means by which we can have relationship, not just with him, but even with other people. Because if God can bridge the gap of holiness, where he is perfect and we are not, what's the smaller gaps? Favorite foods, color on a flag. These things are small. They're not irrelevant necessarily, but in comparison to the gap that we had with God that was so much bigger, when that's been accounted for, when we have that as our example, the smaller things don't get in the way. We have love because we want the relationship more than we want ourselves to be satisfied. We have love when we want the relationship to continue, to grow deeper, and not just be trivial, not just be convenient. Love is about sanctification, not mere synchronization. It's not just about, I'm going to do something nice for you and you're going to do something nice for me. It's, we're going to love God who loved us. It's about, we're going to be refined towards the perfect example of love together. And love is about cultivating holiness, not just happiness. It is very difficult to go into someone's life to be a husband, a father, or a child, or a member of a church, and tell someone in love that they have an unrepentant sin that's going to be a problem. But if the goal is love, if our motivation is love, then we are going to be able to do that. We're going to be able to have that conversation. And if they love us back, they're going to understand that what we're not trying to do is say, hey, I'm the model that you need to model yourself after. I'm not what you need to duplicate. We're saying God is the one that we need to duplicate. And there's a way that you're falling short, and I want to help you with that. And there's a way that I might be falling short that I'm going to need your help with in the future. So it's not just about condemnation. It's about relationship. It's about building those relationships and then letting them move on into eternity. So we don't want to accept any of these substitutes, the, the definitions of love that the world provides that say, you know, oh, it's, it's just, you know, being nice. It's being kind. You know, these things are good, but they aren't the complete picture of love. And so we want to focus on the love. We want to focus on the source of the love. And we want to be in that source every day. We want to be reading the scriptures. We want to be in fellowship with other people. Because if we're in relationship with God, we're going to have relationship with one another as well. Because regardless of where we start from, we're all going to be converging on that same point. We're all going to be getting closer together the closer we also get to God. So closing out, I want you to think about what's next for you today, personally. If you've got faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, then how you answer the, the question of am I being loving is going to be different than if you don't have that faith. If you haven't received Jesus Christ, 
you haven't declared him as Lord and Savior. And so I would commend you to do that, to give your life to him. Because anything else that we offer, I mean, we're trying to offer physical assistance. You know, some folks are stuck in their home, uh, they're sick. And so we want to try and have delivery services available where people from the church are able to go out and shop for them and bring uh, food and supplies. And those things are good, but it's not as good as the truth, the love that we have through God. And so, again, if you've got questions online, if you're in the area, let us know that you need to pray that prayer, that you want to declare Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And we would be happy to welcome you into the family of God because there's no limit to how big that family can be. Do you have hope for the fulfillment of promises that God has made? We're told throughout Scripture that this life is not the end. And so even if we are at the end of our life, it's going to go on. But that end, whether it's a relationship or a work circumstance or a political circumstance, that can be scary. You know, how do we trust God in that? We do it through understanding and filling back up on God's love. When we know and can trust in what he is doing in our lives, then we don't have fear, we have hope. Because we know that what's going to come is so much better than what we already have. And we know that even in the best moments that we've got in this life, the ones that are going to come in the next are going to be even better. Another one is, do you have fellowship with other disciples? Are you meeting with people and pursuing love, trying to understand love, trying to live out love? Because, if, again, if we're in relationship with God, and that was what we got from this relationship, it's not going to be on our own. We're not going to be by ourselves. We're going to be walking out that love in other people's lives. And they're going to be doing the same for us. So if we're not meeting somehow, whether it's through the internet, through phone calls, then there's a problem that's going to grow where we're going to forget what that love really looks like because we don't get to experience it when other people demonstrate it through their actions in our life and we don't get to share it by demonstrating our actions in theirs. And finally, do you take action to make disciples of all nations? Even the word nation these days has more of a political context than genetic, but what are you doing to share that truth? What are you doing to demonstrate that love? Is it a comment on social media? Is it preaching from a street corner? Is it serving people in their home? What is it that you're doing to draw attention to the love that we have through Christ? Think about these questions and where you're at. And so, love is distinct. Love is something special that we have only through God. What the world offers is a, an imitation at best. It's a, a cheap counterfeit. And so what we want is the genuine article. We want the real thing, and then we want to share it with others. And that was perfected through Jesus Christ, and we can rest in that. We can have faith that in that, and we can walk in that. So what I'm going to do is I want to pray for us real quick, and then uh, we're going to try and order, uh, arrange for uh, communion. Dear God, you have loved us so much. Lord God, you have sacrificed in ways that we only begin to understand in this life. And Lord God, it is so difficult for us to be in relationship when the relationships are strained by choices that are made based on selfishness, based on fear, based on pain. But Lord, your love overcame hatred. Lord, your love overcame our despising of you. And so Lord, if your love can overcome that, there is nothing that cannot be overcome. Lord God, your love overcame sin and death. And we have promises, and we have hope, and we have a future to look forward to, even when what we see in front of us right now is very dark, it's very isolating. But Lord, you have promised to be with us now and to the end. Help us to be there for others too. Help us to be bold in proclaiming your love for others. 
Lord God, help us to adhere to the understanding of what that love is, to not accept the substitutes, to not allow the word love, what you have done, to be diminished. Lord God, we thank you so much for what you have done through your son, Jesus Christ, the demonstration of love that we have through him. And so now, for those who are at home and here, we're going to break bread, Lord God, and we are going to remember that sacrifice. We are going to honor it, and we are going to spend time praying. Lord God, please bless the bread and the juice in all the homes around the country and even around the world. Lord, whoever is hearing this message and whoever is now partaking to remember of the love that you showed to us. Lord God, please bless those people. Please bless the elements and give them a full tank of love to go into this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Because of the virus, we can't have a lot of people actually in the building, but we want to try and still have an opportunity for people to share in communion. So the body of Christ that was broken for us on the cross and the blood that was shed, these are the things that we use to remember the love that was demonstrated to us, the high price that was paid. Please partake of the elements and spend some time thinking about that, praying about how you can better demonstrate God's love, how if you don't know what that love is, that you could believe, that you could seek God out, and that he would meet you, and that you would find out. free to continue in prayer, uh, but for those who are ready to respond, uh, join us in another song. everyone for joining Choose Life Church live stream. I mean just, just, just a great time for us to be able to experience this uh, like at a time together uh, regardless of the circumstances and regardless where we are. I want to make just a couple of announcements. First of all, thank you for joining us. We would love to grow together and then for the next two or three weeks every work day uh, or, or every work evening per se Monday through Friday at 6 30 we would love to be studying uh, we would love to study the book of James together. So that's going to be a 20-minute podcast or 20-minute live stream on Facebook. You can find me and join us. It's um, uh, Yuri Sinchenko and, and, or come to Choose Life Church. The link will be there as well. You know, at 6.30 p.m. every night, Monday through Friday, it's like the evenings with James. We'll take the Gospel of James and study this together. Also, I mean, if you would love to, I mean, we really rely right now on you, on as we would love to bless you, we ask you so that you would participate in the ministry of the church itself. You will see some links below that you can actually make the financial contribution for the church so that we can continue to help people in tangible ways, both here and in, in like locally and globally as well. This is a great time for us to celebrate Christ. You know, we remember, let's remember this, that we are never alone. There is always somebody in this fire with us. God is with us wherever we go. 
So blessings to you. Thank you for this time. If you haven't had a uh, chance to participate in communion, we just ask you so that you would go and take the piece of bread and uh, glass with juice and uh, grape juice and participate it. Pray and then so that you can feel uh, this uh, unity with the church. If you're watching us on, online right now or you will be watching this later, let it be the time of unity together. Blessings to you and let's remember there is another in the fire with us. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. There is another in the fire.